<sighs> hello, Fyros. I mean, hello, I'm Fyros. Hello, Fyros. Hello, I'm Fyros. You're Fyros. We're all Fyros. Welcome to Fyros Reborn. Uh, this is the channel. Um, I don't think I mentioned I had my hair cut. I had my hair cut. It should be pretty obvious that I had my hair cut. I had my hair cut. Um, yeah, because I wanted to. And uh, people tend to say stuff about my hair. And they're like, oh, why did you cut it? Or you should have cut it long before anyway. So just, it, it's my hair. Leave, leave, leave. <laughs> Put a force field around it. Just leave. And just any comments that feel like coming in can just ping off before they even come out of the mouth. Um, okay, so yesterday I did a Fire Officer story time, which was based mainly in sort of present day reality. Um, I was speaking about the fact that I went to boom, 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 watch some remote control cars driven driving around. Now... I need to get back to talking about the uh, psych ward experience and it's a strange feeling just now because I feel like if I don't do this video I probably won't be able to sleep um, until I do the video so I was like okay it's it's like later than I would normally start a video this is 20 to 2 in the morning normally I start at like midnight because everyone's asleep and it's a quiet period and I can just focus and do this. Um, and I'm in a, I'm a night owl anyway, so if any of you are thinking, oh, why is he up so late? It's 22. This is my normal type of thing. Okay. That's how my life works. So, um, yeah, I need to talk about Mrs. D. Code name, Mrs. D. I need to go back to... I need to take the story back. We need to go back to being in America. And I need to tell you what happened with Mrs. D. Um, this is a pretty tricky part of the story because it's like... Um, well, it's it, it could be triggering for people listening to the story, for one thing. So I'm a bit f afraid of how I'm going to tell the story so that it's not offensive to anyone else. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm just going to have to say what happened as it, as it did happen. Um, and if that's offensive, then I apologize in advance. I'm just telling a story of what happened in the past. Um, yeah, so that was a disclaimer, wasn't it? That was a disclaimer. If you're offended, it's your own fault. <laughs> Damn. Okay. So yeah, like, so I was in. Uh, America. Let's let's go back to America. Um, it was two thousand and seven. <clears throat> I'd been in the hostels for a while. I was in New York, right? I'd met Mrs. D at Jazz on Lennox, the hostel there, and she'd said, "You are so interesting," and I was like, "Yes, I am interesting. You're right. <laughs> I really am. That's good observation." And uh, I feel like putting the light off in the back. Actually, that's, I know that's maybe a bit strange, but it feels more cosy for me to be like this in the darkness. Yeah, I feel a bit exposed. Well, maybe I need to feel exposed. There's too much, oh, I don't know, scariness around. It's too empty and open. And I'm telling this story and I feel a bit open and exposed here. Okay, and it's distracting me though. <clears throat> so, I... Uh, okay, so I met Mrs. D. We didn't have sex that time when I thought we were going to have sex because she was suggesting we push the beds together. Maybe I suggested that. Well, she suggested that we go and share a private room together which all uh, right so i assumed that because of the flirting that had been going on between us that she wanted to get close to me or something but i had obviously mis misinterpreted it or she'd misinterpreted herself which is the one that i'd like to believe because i feel like she was in uh, a lot of denial about her own feelings 
um, which was just very, very confusing because she was giving me mixed signals. She was giving me the signals, all the physical si signals and emotional signals of someone of being interested in me. And then, um, you know, like wanting to spend time with me, flirting with me, giving me kind of um, risque eye contact, um, being intimate with me uh, in terms of what we were speaking about. And then like putting up a, a sex barrier behind lesbianism, which as I've mentioned in previous videos was not real lesbianism anyway, because her last relationship was with a man and she fancied me. So according to a strict definition of lesbianism, being someone who, who only has sex with and fancies um, women, while being a woman, your oneself, uh, she didn't really fit with the definition of lesbianism, yet she would be very firm about stating it, yet her all of her behaviours, or a lot of her behaviours, did not conform to her very self-definition. So I don't know what she was playing at. Anyway, so we kind of got a bit muddled when I got kicked out of my hospital, hospital, hostel, um, because I'm not really sure exactly what happened. I mean, I know that I ran out of money. And I know that I couldn't stay at the hostel anymore. I also know that I went to another one. Um, like, it was just a few blocks over there. <laughs> um, and I stayed there for a few days. Because but this was this was something else. And I don't know whether this is, like, when this occurred. But I had to stay in a different hostel at one point. Because you were only allowed to stay in any one particular hostel for like a maximum of like 14 days at a time or something. And then you have to go somewhere else and then rebook into the hostel again. You weren't allowed. It was just like this limit that you're only allowed to stay in any one of the jazz hostels for like 14 days, I think it was. Or 28 days. I can't remember. But let's say 14 days or 21 days. A fixed period of time, right? And I'd come to the end of that fixed period of time that I was allowed to stay in. At that point, I did have the money for another place because I booked another place. Went and stayed there for a night, maybe even, only just the night. And then came back to Jazz on Lennox and felt again like I was in the right place to be back there. Meanwhile, though, at the other hostel, I had a little flirty exchange with this girl who was leaving. Who was a drama student, I believe. And yeah, and there was this fire, campfire thing. Um, yeah, and there was a bit of guitar playing there and it was kind of cool, but I didn't really get involved because I was only there for one night and it was like not much of a big deal. Um, but something about this girl who I hung out with just very briefly, something really attracted me about her, like her personality um, uh, attracted me, but then she was gone. So there's a theme that was going on in this whole hostel period which is the meeting people and then they disappear so I called it the revolving door like basically people would just come in and then they go out again so it was a hostel right people were only staying for a certain period of time so you get to know them and then they go off on their next part of their trip or they go back home or whatever so it was I don't know it sucked and it in a way it made me not want to get involved with people like not want to yeah get involved not want to get too attached to people because you get attached to them and you get to know them and then they're going home and you feel fucking sad every time or you feel like you're losing these people so it was annoying um and i tried to take the positive benefit out of it which was to learn a sense of detachment um from people and to accept the feelings of loss that were coming along. But in reality, it was annoying because you could never really make long-term connections with people um, who were coming into the hostel, apart from the people who were there as the workers. So that's why I ended up spending so much time with the people who worked there, because they were more constant. Um, and although they did change periodically, like some people left during the time that I worked there, I stayed there, sorry. Um, there was a core of the people who worked there that that was the same 
over over a long period of time so you can kind of get to know people and trust that a little bit more but yeah the whole seeing people come in getting to know them and then seeing them leave um was uh, it's a bit soul destroying because you know it's like you make all these connections and then you're never going to see these people ever again. So it's like you get built up and you get emotionalized and you get to know someone and you get connected to them and then they drift away and you never see them again. And it's not like, um, it's not like on a train, for example, when you have a random conversation sat next to someone every now and again, I have conversations with people on, on the train, like someone who seems to be fairly open. Um, uh, we have conversation that happens maybe one one in one in 10 or one in 15 train journeys I'll have some conversation with someone <laughs> most of the time I don't really want to <laughs> and it sucks when you get to the point in the conversation where you're like I wish I'd never started this now and I'll hurry up to get to the fucking station so I can stop talking to this person um, especially if they turn out to be drunk uh but yeah, um, yeah. So it's not like that where you're only there for a short period of time. You might get to know someone briefly, very, very briefly on a train, and then you never see them again. It's not like that in a hostel. You're spending time with these people. You might go out to hang out with them in various places, or go sightseeing with them, or go to the park with them, or just sit around and chat with them like every day for a few days, and get to know them, become friends with them, right? Because you're in close quarters. And and you develop the feelings, like intimacy, some sense of intimacy with all these different people, these friends, um, male or female, you get to know people. And it's like you, and then they go. Because I was there for a long period of time. Um, like, and other people were mainly coming for a week or a few days or two weeks max, stuff like this. So... It was hard. It was really hard because all these connections I'm making um, and feeling like these people mean something to me and then they're gone. And it's also that you're not quite intimate and f friendly, like in the friend status enough for it to really go past the hostile stage. As in, it's in a very strange like place where you don't become friends for life you become like it's it's there in the hostel and then they go home and you haven't built up enough of a friendship to for it to carry on realistically after that point even though you may try briefly to to keep things going although i am still in contact with one um, one particular person I haven't heard from him recently, actually, and I don't I don't know if I fucked it up because maybe my messages are going into his spam box uh, because I changed my email account recently. Um, but yeah, um, I'm still in contact with one person from that time period, and I maintain that because he is like a link to all that, and it's it makes it feel like it it is real and it did happen because otherwise I have no other reference. Like, no other people have experienced that um, with me, but he did. So that's nice to have um, contact with him. Uh, he's moved on from the hostel years ago, and he now, I think he's living on a boat. <laughs> I don't even know what he's doing anymore. Like, he was going off grid for a while, and he wanted to be living in a boat. He, his name is Anthony, the guy who, does the, who did the painting for the luggage room. Uh, so I'm still in contact with him, which is cool. Uh, but yeah, I need to figure that out because he, I'm thinking that my mail is going into a spam box because I've changed my email address. I'll figure it out. Don't worry. He'll be okay. He'll be okay. He might be dead. People do die. That'll be sad when he dies. Um, and I, th I want to meet him again. I want to go back to like uh, New York, New York. I want to go back to New York and I want to hang out with Anthony again, at least uh, eat a slice of pizza with him or something and see if he still lasts like <laughs> whatever um, and maybe we're not even compatible as friends anymore, maybe because it's been so long that we hang out and it's like how, how are we even here, but I would like that to happen, if I ever get any money under my belt I'm going to go do that 
He lives in Boston. Well, he did live in Boston anyway. Um, I'm going to go do that. I'm going to meet up with him and just hang out and chat shit and tell stories about the past and about Crazy Nat, the, uh, the cleaning lady, stuff like that, and maybe go on some more adventures together. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, okay, so... Yeah, so I was trying to tell you what happened with Mrs. D because I need to get to a point where I basically, I ended up going to stay with her and I can't quite clarify this in my own mind, but I feel like I was planned to go there for two weeks with and we did that and then it went a bit weird and wrong and I had to go live with um bloody hell i had to go live with uh what's his name will briefly and then i think i went back to new york and then i went back to louisiana again um for a second week or, or like a, a second stay and the second stay was even worse because, I mean, I'd already, like, skipped my flight by this point, remember. I'd also already been homeless. I'd also already, like, basically been um, sexually assaulted. Uh, and, yeah, this uh, trying to organise these memories into order. I should say as, as well, when I was um, in the homeless phase and I was, like, living in the uh, bus terminal, kind of, overnight, um, I think I did a little bit of busking outside somehow um, outside the bus terminal but didn't earn any money and I wasn't happy with it and didn't go anywhere um, and then also there was this guy who was trying to get some money for him to get a ticket and he was saying he'd just been out of jail he'd just come out of jail and he needed to get a ticket uh, and I thought he was lying I felt like he was lying I felt like he was just being a homeless person spinning a story and I told some ticket official that he was lying and I feel like I almost got myself beaten up so yeah I was a bit of a mad person as we know um, yeah uh, and I remember I told you the the bit about like ending up in this kind of waiting room thing to and then asked some questions uh, because I'd been staying in the house in the um, bus terminal overnight and you're not allowed to do that so I got picked up by a security person um, and taken to this place I don't mean literally picked up but they they told me to get up and they took me to this place where they asked me some questions and then they took me to this um, homeless shelter type thing which I spoke about before just didn't feel very safe and I didn't want to stay there, so I didn't stay there, and I just basically went AWOL from there. Um, God. Yeah, and ended up calling my parents and saying, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. Can you pay for a ticket? I think, can, can you pay for a ticket to get me to see Mrs. D and so I can stay with her? And they did, so I got on the Greyhound bus and went down to... Baton Rouge to stay with Mrs. D because she was all good with that and happy with that. And uh, when I got there, she was a bit anxious about keeping me entertained because she was going to university during the day and she was worried that I was going to like get bored or something. And she was felt she felt like she wasn't being a good host. And I was like, no, I'm fine. I can just I can entertain myself by staring at a brick. <laughs> I'm pretty self-sufficient in that sense, but she wasn't buying it. But I was like, no, literally, I, I can do anything. And what I ended up doing was just, <clears throat> one thing I ended up doing was um trying to, <laughs> man, I was trying to push a pen through a bottle by fusing the, the like, by using the power of the matrix to, like, I was like, if I can just fuse the atoms of the bottle and the atoms of the pen with the power of my mind and I can just disintegrate the atoms of the bottle and let the pen will just push through it using the power of my mind and I sat there trying to do this for a while 
and and it didn't work. But and I thought, ah, oh, I'm obviously not doing it right, and I haven't tried for long enough, and, I, <laughs> and I'm not rearranging the molecules correctly. Come on, I think I did it with my finger as well. And there was a point where I tried to push my face through the mirror, um, but that was after I smoked the joint. <laughs> Uh, that didn't work because I, I was like, oh, I can definitely get through there. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I need to get through the mirror and into the mirror world on the other side of the mirror world. Just come on then. And I went <laughs> sort of like this, come on then. And it just didn't work. Of course it didn't work. But then I thought, oh, maybe I just haven't done it right. Um, yeah, so I was at Mrs. D's and I was um, trying to push this pen <laughs> through the bottle and then being dissatisfied when I couldn't do it and I couldn't rearrange the molecules using the power of my mind <laughs> oh dear come on just, just just you know I'm not forcefully trying to force it through there I like I'm just I'm trying to literally maybe literally try and rearrange the molecules come on it feels like it's possible <laughs> it feels like it's actually it could happen you know come on just you just, you just, just reintegrate, disintegrate. Ah, oh, come on, come on! I know you imagine if I did do it. <gasps> just, just re, re, disintegrate, disintegrate. It's doing it. It is. I swear. I feel it. I feel it. Ah! <laughs> oh boy! I cannot wait to drink my bottle of wine. Not full bowl. Cannot wait to drink after this video. Fuck, I've still got 40 minutes left. Oh man. Yeah, so that didn't work. Um, and I was playing guitar. Uh, we wrote a song together actually, Mrs. D and I. We wrote a little song. It's uh, It goes something like. I've actually got the. I've got my fucking complaints to you. Well, I could if I could be bothered. So, she wrote some lyrics. One of them I remember was Blue Grey to the Wind's Edge. Blue Grey to the Wind's Edge. I can't sing her words at the same time. I can sing the words that I made up later on. Um, but yeah, I think it was like... <clears throat> Blue grey to the wind's edge. I don't know what else her words were. <laughs> but um, yeah. So I wrote that there with her. <clears throat> And then I later changed it into a different song, which is called Energy Vampires. Oh, energy vampires are in our midst. The energy vampires are in our midst. The energy vampires are in our midst. Energy vampires are in our midst. Um, ah. <laughs> uh... Okay, well, I can't remember the words off the top of my head, apart from that first little bit, which is supposed to be the little intro part. Oh, God. My life is a life of not being able to remember anything. Um, yeah. All right. So I was there in her little kind of... Uh, like a garden room, I suppose you'd call it. It was like a large room 
at the back of the house. Oh, she lived with three other girls. Um, I remember two of them. So maybe there was another one who was away at that time. I remember two of them. Um, one of them was a bit mm, hard to talk to. The other one was very, very nice to talk to and very, very open and accepting and easy to talk to and friendly and kind and stuff. Um, and actually, when things were going wrong with me and Mrs. D, the the kind, open one took me out to the bookshop and to go to the mall and stuff, and we just hung out together. Um, because I think she understood that um, Mrs. D and I were not working out <laughs> as a couple or as a friendship, and it was all going a bit wrong, and that something needed to be done. So she was really, really kind, and I remember her. Um, she was beautiful as well, um, blonde haired um, girl, brown eyes. <clears throat> she had a boyfriend, but um, yeah, she was just a very, very kind, open, understanding um, person. And compared with Mrs. D, she was also a lot more emotionally healthy because Mrs. D was, was a wreck. She was a complete mess. She was an intelligent person, but her sexuality had basically ruined her emotional life and she was pent up she was confused she was mixed signals all the time she was conflicted she would think one thing and do another she would say one thing and do another you know she was um she would feel one thing and think another she was just all over the place um in terms of being able to relate to me and so this other girl, I forget her name, maybe her name was Lindsay, let's say her name, name was Lindsay. Um, she, was, she was just sound, and that's the kind of person that I should have been with. But I was with the one who was deeply conflicted and in all, all sorts of kind of mess, um, and I'd attracted myself to her and attached myself to her. And it started becoming like, it living in some kind of weird nightmare because I was living with this person who was very conflicted about themselves and was blaming me for her own issues a lot of the time as well and so I don't know exactly how it occurred but I was trying to get this person Mrs D to open up and to be a bit more carefree and light-hearted and stop being so serious about life and to try and just relax a little bit and I tickled her a little bit um, under the armpit and she freaked out um, and bearing in mind that this was this was the like the relationship that we had was quite a close one and quite an intimate one. We weren't boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, but the reason that she said yes to me coming to stay with her was because she said she couldn't stop thinking about me and she wanted to see me and she wanted me to be there. And, um, you know, that she was attracted to me, basically. Um, I mean, you don't invite someone to live with you for two weeks who you've recently just met if you're not attracted to them and if you don't feel a connection to them it's just bizarre um so yeah so i tickled her and i think it was main mainly i think because it was in front of her other friend who was living there um not the nice one the one who was more difficult to talk to and i was just trying to get mrs d to loosen up and be a bit more relaxed and so I tickled her a little bit she freaked out she was like you're coming into my personal space and I was like oh man you just the attempt to, <laughs> to make her chill out has <laughs> made her flip out <laughs> instead <laughs> um and then I said without thinking um without pre-planning quite spontaneously um with no malicious intent whatsoever like I just said, what? It's not like I'm raping you. And then that was it. Like, that was, that was, 
I think she either slapped me immediately. I think she slapped me immediately. And then later on when we were discussing it, she kneed me in the balls and slapped me again. And I'd never had that kind of physical violence happen to me before. Uh, it was very painful to be kneading the balls and it was a humiliating thing to be slapped in the face. Um, yeah, it's not nice. The only other time I've ever been slapped in the face by a girl um, was my mum when I was like five years old and I posted a book in the post box <laughs> thinking that they would that it would go home <laughs> so we just bought a new book and I posted it in the post box uh, and when we got home I told my mum and she was really angry with me and she slapped me in the face and that was the only time my parents had ever been violent towards me actually so that was that was the only thing that had ever happened uh, which I should probably still talk about that at some point, but yeah. Um, so Mrs. D just got violent. She slapped me and she kicked me in the balls. Not kicked me, she kneed me in the balls, but it fucking hurt. And it's just wrong, you know. Like, you shouldn't do that. Um, you shouldn't become violent when you're trying to discuss things. Um... So then at that point, I was like, I looked in the mirror and I was trying to kind of plead with my higher self, like, what the hell? How have I got into this situation that where now I'm basically stuck at this person's house and this person is a, turned into a fucking monster of a human? She's being really, um, it's hard to describe what she turned into she was momentarily overcome by this monstrous way of being like she had this strange sadistic glint in her eye um and she like she said afterwards when she kneed me in the balls that it felt good she's like that felt good and i'm like dude you are you even listening to what you're saying like how sick it is that you're taking pleasure in causing me pain and it's i I'm not purposefully trying to harm you and yet you are purposely trying to harm me and I couldn't understand it at all and I feel it's really I was really really mistreated and also I was in a very vulnerable situation there because like I had no power in that situation um I was a guest in someone else's house for a certain period of time and I couldn't just randomly leave so I was effectively just become a prisoner with this horrible, um, what do you call it? House host, horrible host. And I was like, how oh God, let me just please get me out of here. Um, and I don't know if she told me to leave or if I just decided that I was going to leave. It might be a combination of both, but, it wasn't working at all. Uh, even though I mentioned we did have consensual sex as well. I don't know what the hell. This this person was just the fucking most messed up person. Um, most messed up woman I have ever met, I think, who I have ever been in close, intimate quarters with. Because she manifested so many different aspects of personality. Not split personality, but she would just go her moods would change so quickly and she would go from being an intelligent, rational person to being a conflicted, withdrawn person to being an abusive, violent person um, to being manipulative and sadistic to being light and happy and fine like around her family and it was just such a fuck, a mind fuck this person was such a fucking mind fuck and we went to hang out with um, her parents at one point for a meal and I realized where the the mind fuckery had come from because these parents were very very um repressed type of people everything was very very surface um and you the subjects that they were talking about were very removed from reality like it was always talking about stuff elsewhere 
that makes sense. So like, I don't know how to describe it, sports and um, things in the news, just stuff that was kind of elsewhere that wasn't pertaining to them and their relationships. It was always like at one or two or three steps of remove from people's real lived experience and real feelings. Now it was all about objective stuff out there in the world that you could talk about. Um, yeah, and I and I got the sense that there was this real tension in the whole family system and a real repression, sexual repression. And the 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 mum was very prim and proper and reserved and like held in. You know, when you get that sense that these women who have been um, repressed or they are repressed, or they feel repressed, whatever, and they're like very, very tight and very held in and they're very curt. She was like that. And and the dad, I'm not sure, but I felt like there might have been some abuse between the dad and her, um, that there might be some reasons for why she was so messed up with regard to her sexuality and her sexual expression was all over the place. So... I was like, oh, God. And her ex-boyfriend was there with me as well. And it was just a very bizarre situation. Like, this this girl was, was a fucking mess. Um, yeah. So, so we had that. And she was just, she was just a strange, messed up person presenting so many contradictions within herself and moving between them like as though they're all separate parts of her and not realizing that they're all kind of linked with her it was almost like split personality but not fully like that um or maybe it was i don't know maybe the lesbian part wasn't happy with the heterosexual part so the lesbian part was in denial of the heterosexual part and then and then and then she randomly got her boobs out one time, either before or after we had the sex. And yet would then forget that that had ever happened and pretend that had never happened um, later on and go into denial about it and then pretend she was a lesbian. And I'm like, you, you crazy person and i'm and i'm being called crazy like i'm supposed to have psychosis uh did you check out what this person is like um you know it's just fuck's sake so uh, another thing that happened actually before i ended up moving out we we went to uh, like I met met up with her at the university, so we went to the university while she went and did some stuff, uh, either a lecture or get some papers or hand in some assignments or something. I don't know what she was doing, but I hung out in the university, which was cool. Um, but as we were going there, she uh, she was saying that that she just wanted to be friends and that I was crossing the line between being friends and relationship. And uh, I just drew this line in the sand. And I was like, look, do you see a line? And she's like, yeah. And I was like, look a bit closer. And she looked closer. And I was like, do you see a line? She's like, well, kind of. And I'm like, look, look even closer. And I was like, do you see a line? And she was like, well, no, it's kind of like a trough with, you know, it's I can see more of the sand and the patterns and stuff. And I was like, yes. Look, we don't have to just be friends or just be a relationship. We can be friends in a relationship or we can have friends with a bit of relationship stuff. It's not so cut and dried as you're trying to make it out to be. Um, yeah, I was quite proud of that in the moment. But I look back and I think maybe she was, she was trying to set all these boundaries to me. And then she wasn't... She wasn't enforcing them. She wasn't actually... like. It was just some strange defense strategy. Like if you're going to set a boundary on the fact that you're not interested in someone, then don't sleep with them. Don't get your boobs out with them and don't let them sleep in your bed next to you. Like don't invite them to come and stay around at your place. That's less. Well, I don't know what the fuck, you know, 
it was messed up basically. So, uh, I told you that she kicked me in the balls, knee me in the balls, whatever. Um, it was just a, it was a nasty period of time, and I really felt horrible in myself after she had slapped me twice and kneed me in the balls and then said that it felt good in this sadistic pleasurable like pleased with herself that she'd punished me or something for saying this rape comment as though that's enough to make a like offhand rape comment is enough to warrant getting a, a slapping and a kicking i'm like what? No. No. Sorry. No. And it turned out, apparently, that she had been raped in the past. Even so, that's no reason to take it out on me. <sighs> so, yeah. Either she kicked me out, or I decided to leave, or a combination of the both. And what happened next was a bit silly, well, very silly. I didn't have that much fear at that time. Um, and I just decided to go <laughs> to each house and knock on their door and ask them if I could stay with them. Thinking, well, maybe it will work. Maybe someone will let me stay with them. But, of course, with the people there being elderly residents of the area in the next houses along, they were extremely uh, freaked out by the fact that this random person was knocking on people's doors and asking if he can stay with them. Now, in a perfect world, right, or in Jesus' time, that should be allowed. That there should no should not be no problem with that. What, 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 fucking, what rule is that breaking? <laughs> what law is that breaking? I don't know, apart from it being weird. But it should be okay to do that, to at least knock on people's door and ask. You know, <laughs> why is that so wrong? In Jesus' time, people would have gone knocking on doors, the Good Samaritan and so on, and say, I'm dying, can you let me in? I have nowhere to stay, can I Can I stay with you? Uh, but no, no, not in, not in <laughs> modern day society, we don't allow that kind of thing. So, uh, someone called the police and the police showed up and I was like, uh, oh, they're probably for me, aren't they? Yeah. And they were for me. So I got in the car, pardon me. And they took me to the bus station where now I'm not exactly sure what happened, whether I got the bus back to New York and then again, I re went back to stay with mrs d a second time and i think it must have been like after the kicking or something i'm not sure because oh, it's so confusing but basically there was a period of time where i wasn't living at mrs d's and i wasn't in new york i was living under a bridge nearby to mrs d's by like just over the way um, and this is when I became creepy and a weirdo even more than I was before. But this is where I was doing some weird shit. Like I gave them muffins that I had appropriated from one of the local coffee shops who was giving out muffins at the end of the day for the homeless people. And I was there and I got given some muffins and I took some of the muffins and left them on the porch outside their door and they got freaked out by it which is understandable because you know that's fucking weird um to receive gifts of muffins and they were just like can you, you just gotta leave us alone now like you're freaking us out uh so i had a conversation with her and she said yeah you gotta leave us alone like you're freaking us, freaking us out kind of thing and i said come and check out this little area that i found which is living under the bridge like a troll. It's really cool. It's really peaceful and quiet. And it's really nice. And she never did. But that was the last I saw of her. I might have kept in contact with her a little bit after 
um, America. But then, no, just we both blocked each other. She blocked me, and that was the end of it because it was messed up, basically. Um, yeah, but so I lived under a bridge for a while, and then this hobo guy came along um, who had blonde hair, gristly skin, and he was always shouting and raving about stuff and telling about all the different fights that he'd been in, things like this, and oh, that's a whole part of the story to itself. I mean, this is kind of coming towards the end. This is like the culmination of the whole adventure, really, um, living under that bridge. Uh, yeah, so I'm not going to cover that now, because that's a whole part to itself. Um, yeah, so I should go back through, maybe, um, and just reiterate some of the points that were shitty. Like being slapped in the face a couple of times and being kneed in the balls for making a, a, a glib, offhand, random rape comment that I didn't realise was more offensive than it would have been had she not been raped uh, in the past. This sucks. This story sucks. So, yeah. It sucks. It fucking sucks. And I can't even fucking remember it clearly in the right order either. I wish I'd been able to do this. Come on. Ah, oh, man. It's still too hard. It's still like so many little details in there. <clears throat> uh, okay, well, I'm going to leave this video now and I'll revisit this ending point of the story. Uh, next time because <clears throat> there's too many I've got like lots of little memories in there that all were around this last part of the journey um, and I'm going to have to put them all into one thing and that could take a while so I'm going to say goodbye thanks for watching this far I know it's like a bit of shitty um, point in the story so I'm kind of living under a bridge like a troll with another hobo who is much more like a troll than I was. <laughs> and I'm going to leave it there after being kicked out or, and leaving Mrs. D's house because our relationship turned very, very sour for reasons that I don't fully understand. Thanks for watching. See you next time.